So it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, be able to introduce the uh, star of the silver screen over here, uh, Emilio Amigo, who has, is a clinical psychologist and director of the Amigo Family Counseling in Columbus, Ohio. He's worked with uh, autism for 20 of the last 25 years in that um, facility, and I think we'll hear a lot more about, you, you saw, what, an hour and a half of 225 hours of, of filming that was, uh, went into that movie. So there's a lot, uh, a lot more he can talk about. And Liz Feld, who is the president of Autism Speaks, uh, she's been president there since June of 2012. She's had a long career in focused on advocacy and communication from ABC News to Nickelodeon to the White House. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll, I'll start out with you, uh, uh, Emilio, and that is um, really talking about that whole experience. We saw just sort of the artist's window into what happened. Uh, what's your perspective of, one, the experience that they, they had, not just the three real focus areas of that, but the whole class, and then what was the outcome? I think my first impression was that it, it, it's a very honest film. Um, it's a very accurate film. Um, when someone comes into your, your work and your world and 200 plus hours of footage and then they say they're gonna make a documentary, I didn't know what to expect. And I can honestly say that what you saw in the film is who we are, what we do, um, those are the people that we have the privilege of working with. And um, it's just, for me, it's just a, an expose on honesty and authenticity, being real, being human. And um, I'm just so proud to be a part of it. Excellent. One of the things that, uh, you know, uh, the film taught me just by looking at it, and I'm not certainly an expert on autism, but the, um, it's, typically characterizes, I understand, by a lack of empathy to others, a lack of connection, direct connection to others. And what I saw that was very poignant at the end um, is that rather than everybody being in their own world at the end, they were all focused, they were all social, they were mm -hmm. all together as we would expect if they, right. they didn't have that condition. Right. How did that convey into the behavior afterwards. What was the aftermath of, you know, we had a big mm -hmm. conclusion that we saw in the movie, but what's the, right. how does that change well, lives? Well, um, I think for some of them, they experienced a miracle. I mean, they really felt like, I survived, um, I had a great time. It, it's a, a memory that will last forever. Um, and from there, uh, individuals have continued to go out and group dates, dating, um, having friends come over, um, it, it's, it was just a, um, it's like a survival experience. And as a result, everyone grew closer and uh, realized, you know what, I can, have a, I can have this. I can have a taste of life. And uh, they've just continued to progress even beyond. And, and Liz, I was going to just ask you, given, given your experience in Autism Speaks, um, one, this is obviously a subset of the population um, and, and a highly functioning um, what portion of the population does that represent, and, and how often do uh, people actually, are, are they able to get independence? Um, can I first start by saying I thought the film was extraordinary. It's the second time I've seen it, but it's my first time meeting um, Emilio today, and it's such a gift to the autism community, but I think just to the general public to have a film like this made, because what you see is that those kids have so much more in common with um, neurotypical kids then they don't have in common. Mm -hmm. And um, empathy being one, you know, there's so many stereotypes about people with autism, whether they're higher functioning or lower functioning, there's still t stereotypes. And what you see here is that those kids are having the same experiences that other kids are having. So that's, I think it's a very important and powerful message there. Um, you know, interestingly, you'd ask about high functioning because you saw there, um, and, and you look at um, Carolyn, for example, who was, went to college and clearly she was, um, cognitively capable of doing so, and yet she was completely paralyzed when she was faced with the experience. So, you know, you think that that was maybe low functioning. So, I, again, the stereotypes about what's high functioning and what's low functioning, you know, these, what they seem to mostly have in common here are just crippling anxiety and, um, and confusion and um, a lack of self-confidence. Mm -hmm. But, so I, the labels I, I, I have a hard time with um, because 
some of these kids uh, are very high functioning in some ways and very challenged in other ways. But there are so many abilities and talents in these kids. And back to the beauty of the film, what you see here is that uh, given the opportunity and given the leadership and given the forum, there's almost nothing that they can't do. There's just the potential is so great. One of the things that is very popular depiction in the popular media is that autism is a children's disease. What we see here is children moving into adulthood and some adults. Um, one, uh, why is that, is that stereotype wrong? And two, how do families deal with move into adulthood and, and how does a community deal with that um, and getting independence? Um, well, I'll tell you, you know, you're absolutely right. It's such an important point. And, and frankly, you live as an adult a lot longer than you do as a child with autism. It is, it, it is a, um, a disorder that affects people or a condition that affects people throughout their lifespan. And their needs change, their challenges change, and their abilities change as they grow. Uh, and it, it, it's just terrible. You know, the school system, you know, at age 21 or 22, these kids age out of that nest and that protection. And suddenly, you know, many of them are faced with challenges and they don't have the life skills that they need. And for us, a big part of our responsibility in our advocacy uh, and in raising awareness and in working with policy leaders is to let them understand that, that um, adults with autism, you know, they can live 60 years. They need independent living opportunities, uh, employment opportunities. They'll have other medical conditions that will affect them, you know, beyond their autism and possibly a lot more challenging than their autism. And the awareness piece of this is so critically important for us as we go out and try to get, um, get legislative officials really to, uh, to help develop policies that are gonna help us address the needs of these communities. And right. parents will tell you their biggest fear is that, as you heard in the film, when they die, you know, they wanna make sure that these, their young adult children um, are gonna be taken care of and, and have um, enough ability to, uh, to live as independently as possible. How does the experience that that you uh, put the, probably not, not just the um, um, uh, people with autism, but their families that you put them through, how does that help them? And, and what's your experience in getting them independence or codependence mm -hmm. on, uh, we talked about this on the, last night a little bit, codependence on some of their other classmates? Right, um, well, you know, tonight you saw a, a lot of our adult clients, but, um, in my practice, we work with young children, you know, young teens, as well as the adults. And what I find is, as we're working with them, they, they begin to realize that uh, they need and want to have connections with people outside of just their immediate family. And that uh, in addition to their loving family, they want to create what we call a second family. Um, and to, to connect with others and to realize the benefits of being involved with others and then seeing that they have strengths. Uh, sometimes we, we so program our, our children and we have great resources for them, but they haven't figured out what they're capable of doing independently of those resources. And I think so the adolescent stage and early adulthood is almost like a reawakening, like who am I? And how is my autism going to affect my life? And what do I want? And how do I get there? It's almost like they take ownership of it more so than when they're young children. And I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, I think it's exciting, it's terrifying, but um, it's a journey that you can be successful in if you're not alone. And I think, to me, that, that film is a reminder of the community that my adult clients have established amongst themselves. We might have facilitated it, but we can't give it to them. We can't do it for them. They did it. And I think that has just empowered all of them we well, use an interesting uh, expression that you're sort of introducing them to the mess of life, Absolutely. which we've all had to do when we, we grow up. Um, right. And it just happens later in their stage, and it becomes more obvious that they're going through it. Right. Um, how do they, do you find that over time, like all of us, they get used to it? And, they, and do, they do, they do. It, it becomes less of a catastrophe. I mean... You know, friendship ends, or a date didn't go as well as you wanted, or you know, you got a pimple on your face, and, and when you're going to work, and all of those things that we struggle with and we're scared of, but you you wake up the next morning, and and you're stronger for it. So I think that we've we help address you know anxiety and depression in this population. It's it's critically important. Well, you to could work you could that. see that in Jess when she was just paralyzed about the decision about who she should go with 
or whether we should go with something. And and yes, a lot of girls go through that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that is that, not. that was female, right? <laughs> yeah, a unique situation. But but what I what I saw in there is that having somebody there, and in this case you, that can resolve that situation, give right. them an easy out. Right. I was reframing it. I was making it. This isn't a catastrophe. It's not the end of your life. There's still hope. You're still going to have fun. There's still choices. And I think it's, it's about giving them hope, you know, hope that they can understand and value. Um, uh, it's got to be internal. So, you know, it's got to be their desire. And uh, I think that's what you saw in the film. One of the things that I saw in the film, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to some questions from the audience. And, and uh, Liz, we talked about this. Um, and you saw this in Meredith, um, the focus on computers. You know, before that, it was books. Uh, we talked about computers have a whole variety of impacts uh, in this particular disease, um, some of them very scary. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how computers are affecting this? Yeah, you know, certainly, listen, for any parent, you know, they worry about what their kids are going to start exploring and doing on the Internet. But um, some of these kids, you know, they're, they're not aware of the dangers. Um, they're, obviously, the privacy issues um, are so important, and you have kids who go on, they want to make friends. You know, they're, home, they're in front of the computer, they want to connect. They'll give out, often give out information that they shouldn't, that is not appropriate. A lot of circumstances we know, kids put pictures of themselves up, and they're, we all know the, you know the lunatics who are out there who can um, take advantage of these really vulnerable this, this population. So there are a lot of great uh, programs out there right now. In fact, Google's doing a lot on internet safety. Uh, and we do, we're doing a lot at Autism Speaks. Uh, and schools are doing it also, but that's a—it's a, it's a danger. It's not unique to this community, but this is such a vulnerable population, and uh, it's really important. Those are issues that these kids, even though they're 25 or 30, they're still not nearly as um, as aware of what can happen. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. I'm just—it was a wonderful film. Um, just, oh. but I want to ask you, they connect with each other and become friends with the, within their group. Do they branch out at all, or mm -hmm. is that, they do? Yeah, um, some of the scenes that you saw when, when you saw a larger collection of clients, um, that was our Friday night club program where we have maybe six or seven therapy groups for adults, and then two Fridays a month, all of those group members are invited to come together. And it's sort of a club theme program. So they go from knowing six or seven or eight other individuals to possibly 30. And so out of those numbers, they start to socialize. We encourage them to socialize on their own on the opposite Fridays or other days of the week. So yes, it has progressed beyond. So they do go outside their own confines. Yes, yes. Yeah, like they, they've joined um, athletic teams at their school, extracurricular activities. Um, thinking, got part-time work, going to college, whereas before they were terrified of it. Um, yeah. Another question. Yes. Did the kids and the young adults in the film? Oh, sorry. Did the kids and the young adults in the film know what you were filming them for, and oh, have yeah. any of them watched the movie? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but before um, we started the filming, I mean, we had multiple sessions of discussion, what this is about, how this would benefit us. We decided collectively that if it wasn't going to be directly helpful to my clients at the moment that they were being filmed or recorded, then we weren't going to do it. And we decided that it was a good exercise in realizing, wait a minute, people videotape, but we videotape each other. You know, we view each other. We record what everybody does around us. We remember what people say. So for us, it was what we call an executive functioning exercise. And um, so it made them much more self-aware and more uh, sensitive to others around them and so forth. So yeah, they knew. And then in addition to that, they believed that it was an opportunity to help others that perhaps had some similar challenges. Emilio? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the main subjects, uh, Caroline, uh, Meredith, and Jessica, and Drew, uh, all were invited by Gedalia Pictures to come out to Sundance, and so they got a chance to talk to um, you know the people who watched the film, and, and they were they were joyous, they were thrilled, they were really proud to be a part of it. It's quite a, again, it's a miracle. 
The parents you showed in the film were extraordinarily patient and caring. What about those parents who find it more challenging to deal with children <laughs> like that? How do you how do you assist them sure. or educate them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's very common for uh, clients in our in our program to uh, be involved in individual therapy, psychotherapy, family psychotherapy. Um, that that's almost a, a given. Um, those parents that you saw were wonderful parents, but they had they have just as many challenging moments as any other parent that wasn't filmed. Um, they they just <coughs> were chosen because their their kids were the, the you know main subjects of the film. But um, it is very difficult, and we allow the parents to kind of form support groups. Like so, when we're doing our therapy groups, the parents have a chance to come together, and it's a lifesaver. I mean, I've had parents come. Uh, for our group sessions when their child was sick at home and you know, they were old enough to stay by themselves But they would come just so they could hang out with the other parents. It's that powerful and that important so um, it, it, It's just about being together. So it really is developing a community even for the parents uh, Greg A little bit of a follow-up to that is the consistency of the involvement with both the kids growing into young adults through adulthood, and also the parents. Is it consistent? You know, do some drop off, do they come back? How have you found that? And, and has that changed over the years of your practice? You mean following like a, one individual? Are they individual? consistent about coming to these groups? I'm sorry? Are, are they consistent about coming to Oh, yes, consistent? extremely. Very, we have incredibly high attendance rate. Very much so. Retention rates. Oh, very much so. Very much yeah, so. you had indicated when we talked um, that when that does drop off or you, you lose some of this extra stimulation, they can very easily regress back to a less social. Oh, sure, sure. Um, we, we find that um, within about six months of being in our program, those individuals, they're dragging their parents to, to come to group. And, and we don't want it to be an end all. It's really a springboard. But it, it becomes uh, necessary. It becomes medicinal. It becomes a point of hope, a point of you know connection, and so forth. Um, we don't we don't have to convince them to come. They 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 figure it out pretty early on, uh, and I think that's part of it. We have great staff. I think we really care about the individuals. There's a lot of empathy. I hope you saw that among everyone, and um, it, it, it's a, it's a place of healing and, and growth. So yeah, we we have strong uh, attendance and retention. Do we have another question? Yes, in the back. Can you describe the supply and demand of services like yours? Is there a waiting list? Uh, is there, is, are you looking you for more? probably both address. Yes. Yes. And then perhaps, I, I'm, I'm really curious I can talk to know about more broadly in the micro the level. Um, yeah. No, we do not have a waiting list uh, because we have, I run probably 15 different therapy groups of my program, and so we've got, we have room for, for more people. I've got great staff that helps out. In our groups we have, I'm always the leader, and we've got anywhere from two to three assistants in addition to, to me being there. So, um, no, we don't have waiting lists. As far as what's available in the community, I can only speak to Columbus, Ohio. Um, there's other larger organizations that tend to take a, a more, a stricter, more behavioral approach which is exactly what some individuals need. Our, our program tends to be more experiential, behavioral, emotional, relational. So um, we have kind of a little niche maybe, um, but uh, no, we don't have a waiting list. Yeah, the, there, it depends very much where you live um, and how old your, your children are or the adults are who are living with autism, but there's no question that there's a real lack of, of opportunities, supports and services, whether they're recreational, educational, um, more therapeutic and supportive that way. Um, there are some wonderful programs around the country that we, we look at and try to replicate and help fund so that we can make sure that they're available to people everywhere. But the truth is, it really depends on your zip code. And for us, again, back to um, how important it is to see programs like this, and then for us and, and all of you to go out and talk about the need, and, um, and that actually these things can be done on a very small scale just in your own neighborhood. They don't have to be you know, some big, you know, bureaucratic um, mm -hmm. 
program. Uh, sometimes for many families, there, it, there's a question of, you know, cost and expense and what kinds of programs, you know, what, are they things that can be reimbursed? Um, either through insurance or through some other form that can be available through schools or your house of worship or, um, you know, in other neighborhood groups, you know, part of other programs that exist that we tack onto. But we're always looking for good programs because are, parents are they, reach out. Are they commonly covered by, um, by medical insurance? No, they're not. They're not. Um, in fact, we didn't even use, their uh, behavioral treatments didn't even used to be covered by insurance until families got together and advocacy groups got together several years ago. Um, we were one of them, but many of them did and banded together and, and um, have fought state by state to make sure that um, treatments are covered, but things like this are not covered by uh, are not covered by insurance. I don't even know if you uh, Actually, charge, well, but... Yeah, I mean, in Ohio, I'd say about half of uh, our clients have insurance coverage. Uh, in network, out of network, uh, front county funding helps. Um, o Ohio has an autism scholarship fund, so they, they so Ohio's, you know, I guess I'm proud of Ohio in that regard. Go, no, but it's true, and it go really, Bucks, the, and um, Massachusetts is like that. There are but, a couple of states that are model states. Yeah, so I, I'd, I'd say it's about 50-50, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> And while you're waiting, just a quick comment, too. Keep in mind that this wasn't the only time we had a dance. Like, we would routinely, probably three, four times a year, have dances. Like, we have a really large waiting room, and we'd have, depending on the season, we'd have dances, and we'd have big events. So we're trying to get them comfortable with this. And we probably start that fourth, fifth, sixth grade, if you will. So they had experience building up to this. This was just on a grander you know, level, if you will. Uh, and then we also have theater programs and dance classes and acting classes and different things. So all of those, you know, services kind of contributed to this being so successful. I think you have to do that when they're younger. Um, hi. There's a lot of things going through my head right now, but um, my son has Down syndrome. So this was a very interesting topic for me, um, having watched the autism community being just really great advocates and, and raising awareness and getting policy changes and things like that made. I do want to talk about the insurance aspect real quick, just a little bit off topic, but um, insurance does cover certain things. For my son, the doctors can't put down Down syndrome as a diagnosis on anything. The insurance companies won't cover it. So he gets speech therapy covered, but it has to be put down as um, uh, acute ear infections. So it's, it's, a, it's a code trick that parents have to do to figure out what code is the insurance company going to accept so that my kid can talk. Um, it's, it's really difficult, anyway. So, but I, I wanted to just point out one thing um, that Liz said, which was about kids having the same experiences as typically developing kids. And, and one thing that one of the parents in the film said about her strengths are so much bigger than her struggles. And I think that's one thing that when we look at kids, no matter what kind of disabilities they have, whether it's autism or Down syndrome or any other range of things, is that right now in the schools, in policymakers, with insurance companies, in neighborhoods, wherever it is, it's seeing what's wrong with the kids mm -hmm. and not what they can do. And the struggles that parents have to go through to advocate and try to prove to the schools that yeah, my kid's going into kindergarten. He can count to 100. He knows all his letters and numbers and shapes and colors. Why do you want to stick him in a special ed room? It makes no sense. He has no academic delays. So it's that fight. And how can you get over that fight? And how do you raise awareness with school districts or whoever it is to understand that we know you don't have any resources, but if you don't make this if you don't help him now, he's never going to have a job. What's mm -hmm. uh, yeah? So, Liz, why don't there's you... so much there? I mean, that she, she yeah. just said it all. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what, what I'll ask both of you to is sort of summarize, maybe Liz, in terms of the the state of where things are are going in terms of coverage uh, of that organizations like your organizations and how they help, and then uh, Amelia, if you could just finish out and saying sort of what's next, where where are things going next with your with your okay. group. Well, so much of this is about um, making sure that everybody understands what the potential is for these kids. And all of our potential is different. So we, right from the get-go, it's to recognize and respect and appreciate. And never mind what the law is that the kids are entitled to um, 
the services in school and you shouldn't have to be in there fighting for them all the time. You know, but we just, um, Autism Speaks and several autism organizations just partnered with the National Down Syndrome Society on some of the most important legislation that's ever been passed you know, in Washington. It's the ABLE Act, which essentially establishes 529 tax-free savings accounts, just like there are for college uh, uh, savings, but for medical um, costs over the course of a lifetime uh, for people who live with any disability. There are 58 million people in this country who didn't have, who lived with the disabilities, who didn't have that kind of opportunity just to save tax-free. And there's been, a, you know, we've been working at the state and federal level on bills like this because, frankly, it's been discriminatory against people who live with disabilities, whether it's on insurance coverage or tax-free savings accounts or... Um, and their caregivers. And their caregivers, their yeah. Family. So... Um, you know, as advocacy groups, you know, together, we can do a lot more than we can do alone, so we're doing a lot of partnering across the board, and, uh, and, and the raising awareness piece of this is just huge. But it's really all about uniting behind our shared humanity and making sure that everybody understands that whether it's an opportunity for a job or a place to live independently or, um, you know, access to services and supports, that um, we're all entitled to the same thing. Right. And I would only add to that, that um, I find that the greatest challenge for me is to help these individuals understand what they are capable of doing. Um, when, when you're a young adult with living with autism, I think it's important to realize what I'm capable of doing. What, what do I want? How do I get there? Um, I want them to want to have friends because they want to have friends, because they value that. I want them to want to have a job because they realize with the job comes benefits and comes opportunities and comes experiences. Um, I, you know, I think in, on the one hand, you're, we emphasize get the community you know, on board and everyone else, and I agree with that 100%. I think my little piece is getting the client on board. You know, like I'm capable. I should be able to have a prom. I should be able to look beautiful and be handsome and be smart and be employed. And, and have a new, uh, network of friends, why not? And I think once they believe, then it makes my work that much easier, if you will, it's, it's more exciting. And then we can join up with yeah. the forces that you're talking about and the, you know, the agencies and so forth. But if the individual doesn't believe, you know what I mean, it's really limited because we've got to convince them of what they're capable of doing. One of the things, can I say one last thing that I think the film shows so, effectively um, is how hard these kids work. Yeah. You know, and we know that about these little, you know, some of these kids who start early intervention at age two or three or five, you know, this is hard work. It's 40 hours a week of intensive therapy. And then as they get older, it's things like this. They're working so hard just to, you know, connect with somebody, um, to get a job, to learn how to rinse her hair. The scene about Meredith, rinse your hair, rinse your hair. Yeah. It's so profound. Yeah. And I think the tenderness from the parents and the patients, someone said earlier, and the love, they see how hard their kids are working. And we know um, how hard these kids were, are, and adults are working. And uh, that was a very, it was a, so important that you had that in there. Well, I think I speak not only for myself, but uh, hopefully for the audience here. Not only did I find the movie inspiring, I also found it very educational. And um, thank, thank you for what you're doing in this area. Thanks, thanks everybody. They, they have agreed to uh, stick around for a little while if you have any questions one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I thanks know so it's late. Thank thanks. You.